<coughs> Can you hear that in the back? Is that okay? Yeah? Good. Um, a few days ago, I was uh, in a bookshop in Oxford, uh, wandering around, and uh, I noticed a stand of books uh, of subjects made simple, you know? Chemistry made simple, sociology made simple, and so on. And standing there beside it was uh, an old friend of mine, a very eminent Oxford philosopher, who was leafing through the Philosophy Made Simple volume. So, seizing the opportunity of a jape, I crept up behind him and murmured in his ear, that's a bit difficult for you, isn't it? <laughs> Whereupon he swung round and um, it wasn't my friend at all. <laughs> it was a total stranger. I stuttered an apology and scampered out of somewhere in the world there's a man who believes that people in Oxford are so odiously elitist that they jeer openly <laughs> at complete strangers <laughs> trying to improve what their minds so are. Wherever, wherever he is, I apologize to him. I'm very sorry about that. It's not true. Uh, well, that story has... Uh, what is the relevance of that story to my topic crisis in the humanities, um, none whatsoever. Uh, however, the next story I will tell you has a, re a relevance to it. A few years ago, I was being shown around by what I think is the biggest university in South Asia, actually in Korea, by uh, its proud president, a man who was waxing lyrical about his sort of futuristic uh, business center and avant-garde management studies institute and so on and he was flanked by two young heavies two young men in dark suits with earpieces and for all i know you know kalashnikovs stuck under their jacket who were his, his minders his bodyguards you know he was the sort of president of the university uh, anyway once he'd done singing the praises of his you know cutting edge technology studies and magnificent managerial center i asked him why there seemed to be no critical studies of any kind on the campus. He looked at me as though I'd asked him how many PhDs in pole dancing they awarded each year and said in a rather strangulated voice, um, your point will be noted. <laughs> that kind of threatening undertone to this, really. Uh, um, so he then produced some gleaming technological device from his pocket uh, and spoke a few words of Korean into it, which probably killed him. Yeah. <laughs> and then a car, a car the length of a football pitch arrived, probably bulletproofed and maybe equipped with a supply of his blood in a case of would-be assassins, and he was whisked away, wondering, no doubt, why the English were so incurably stupid as to ask questions of that kind. It was all a very far cry from my 30 years at Oxford where uh, typing a note to one's colleagues rather than handwriting it was regarded as very vulgar. And the only technology around the place was a little little pulley in the senior common room whereby the, uh, the port and Madeira were hoisted up from the butler's pantry uh, to the dessert table. I can't see the Korean president being greatly impressed by that. What that incident signifies, I suppose, is th the fact that we're currently living through an event almost as momentous in its own way as, say, the discovery of penicillin or the melting of the polar ice cap, but one which has been so stealthy and insidious and gradually pervasive that it's not been all that visible, namely the final capitulation of universities on a global scale to the priorities of advanced capitalism. I was in South Africa a few years ago um, where the ANC were talking about the Thatcherization of the universities. Um, 
Well, I've tried to resist this development, this sort of neo-managerial technolog technologistic approach to higher education for some years, uh, but I've finally surrendered, I'm afraid. It's been too much for me. I now, um, it's now my practice at the beginning of a class to ask the students how many of them can afford my hundred pound insights into a literary text, you know, insights for which they would have to pay a uh, hundred pounds, really, you know, sort of deep and illuminating insights, um, as opposed to one or two mildly intelligent perceptions costing uh, 50p a piece or something like that. Um, I mean, and for those fanatical Democrats who would dismiss this teaching method as odiously hierarchical, um, uh, let me make it clear, you know, that I do allow the less well-heeled students, less affluent students, to put down a deposit on my brightest ideas and pay the rest off weekly. <laughs> or, if this proves beyond their financial powers, uh, to perform a few little domestic tasks for me uh, in exchange for one or two aperçus about, you know, Milton or Proust or whatever it happens to be. I mean, as a radical, I've always been concerned to narrow the gap between academia and everyday life, and having graduate students iron my socks or take out the garbage in return for a little chat about Shakespeare um, strikes me as a constructive move in this direction. I'm rather proud of it myself. I don't want to be too self-righteous, but I am. Um, I should actually, I call this talk The Crisis of the Humanities. Uh, it's a terrible cliche, isn't it? I wonder how many books there are now with that title. It's an awful platitude. Um, not only is it, um, is it a, a cliche, but there's a sense in which it's a tautology, uh, rather as the word internet is a tautology. Have you ever seen a net that isn't inter in some way? You know? um, uh, a tautology being, of course, the opposite of an oxymoron, meaning a self-contradictory phrase, the traditional um, much favoured oxymoron, of course, has been military intelligence. Um, but um, I actually prefer business ethics. I think business <laughs> ethics <laughs> is a wonderful oxymoron. Yes. Um, uh, I, I have a son who's a, a student at Oxford, and um, he, he edits a little rag called the oxymoron. And I was able to tell him that um, Sam Beckett once said that he had a strong weakness for an oxymoron, a strong weakness. Um, crisis in the humanities is a tautology because, um, in a sense, th there is a sense, isn't there, in which the humanities have always been in crisis, indeed, that they were actually born in crisis, yes? Um, crisis and the humanities go together like Coke and Charlie Sheen. Um, I mean, it's not as though there was once a kind of stable formation known as the humanities with a secure identity, which was then blown off course by some internal or external crisis. Uh, on the contrary, it was out of a certain historical crisis, I suppose, that the humanities arose in the first place. In fact, the humanities and industrial capitalism were pretty well born at a stroke were pretty well twinned at birth, certainly in Britain, the first, the oldest industrial capitalist nation in the world, certainly in Britain at the end of the 18th century. And what that meant was that values which could no longer really find a home in this uh, crassly materialist, increasingly acquisitive order, um, had to find that home somewhere else. Yeah? They couldn't find a home in that situation. Um, and as the 19th century drew on, this protected enclave where these rather fragile values were nurtured and nourished went under a whole number of names, I mean, Geist, the arts, civilization, culture, the humanities, and so on. Uh, because this little enclave, this region, was structurally distinct from the established social order, um, it was able to act as a fairly powerful critique of it from time to time. By the same token, however, this distance 
from other forms of social practice or institution ensured that that critique was fairly ineffective. In other words, society could live with it, basically. If you think of this in terms of the human body, as I always um, remind my graduate students that unless they have the word body in the title of their thesis or book, they're simply not going to get it published. I'm sorry, it's just a, it's a sad fact. Of, you know, in my day, it was dialectics. You had to have the word dialect, the dialectics of the imagination or something like that. Like there's always a buzzword. Um, but if you think of this in terms of the human body, it was as though the body had been split down the middle. Part of it was, was a disciplined, instrumentalized, efficiently laboring, profit-reaping creature, but only by siphoning off all the energies which didn't seem to go with that, namely spiritual, erotic, symbolic, gratuitous, and so on. Uh, into some different sphere altogether so that they could be nurtured and cultivated in separation from the contaminating influence of society as a whole. At this point, the very, wor the very idea of the social or the political becomes um, somewhat degraded. And this is, as it were, you might say, the worst kind of romanticism. There is a radical, better kind of romanticism, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, yet another name for this protected enclave, along with the arts, humanities, culture, dice, civilization, and so on, was in fact the universities. Universities seen as a center of hu humane critique. Um, and as the name university suggests, it was also a place which sought to promote some general or universal or integrated vision of humanity in a social order that was becoming alarmingly fragmented and specialized. Um, so indeed did the arts. Uh, what had happened to the arts, I think, is very interesting at this point. What happens is that um, traditionally, you know, there were jobs for artists. They, th th um, they could be employed by a patron or by the church or by the state, by, ar by the aristocracy and so on. Um, and therefore they could justify their existence as functional, yes, in what we might call pre-modern society. They could justify their existence by flattering a monarch or praising a patron or recounting the heroic history of the tribe, uh, entertaining the court, contributing to the worship of God, and so on. There were jobs around for artists then. Um, what gradually happened by the end of the 18th century <coughs> is that um, the arts were now increasingly part of general commodity production. They were addressed not to God or to the monarch or to a patron, but to anybody with the money to buy them and the taste to appreciate them. They were struck anonymous, as it were. You know, artists could no longer know whom he or she was producing for in the anonymity of the market. But all of this, which sounds rather dismal, uh, could be cunningly turned to advantage by what one might call the heritage of romantic, of ra radical romanticism, um, in the sense that this, la this apparent dysfunctionality of the arts in early industrial capitalist society, uh, this alienation of the arts from society as a whole, um, could be seen as precisely their point. You know, the point of, the, of, of art was to be gloriously pointless. Yes. And so, to act as a kind of image of utopia, not by what it said, simply by its very existence, by the strange, persistent, nigh impossible existence of this thing that um, uh, didn't believe that anything that lacked immediate utility therefore lacked value, which was the overriding view, ideological view at the time. So, um, perversely, paradoxically, a new and revolutionary function could be plucked from this homeless, dysfunctional condition of the arts, the arts thrown open to the anonymity of the marketplace, and this function was, n was, was really a kind of critique. For the first time in history, you might say, the arts were now 
independent enough of the sovereign powers to turn on them and hold them to account. Because the problem with, the art, with artists having a job, with the arts as integrated into instruments of religious or political or other forms of power, was of course that the artist was essentially a medium of ideology, uh, a medium, an instrument of that power itself. So virtue could be wrested from the jaws of historical necessity. Alienation could be turned to a constructive end. Dysfunctionality could be converted into a kind of spiritual transcendence. The work of art, all the way to the writing of Theodore Adorno, could now find a new destiny for itself in resisting the commodity form. Ironically, of course, it was a commodity on the market, but spiritually speaking, it resisted that form. Uh, and the last doomed attempt at this freedom and autonomy and self-dependency of the work of art was known as modernism. A self-dependency and freedom and autonomy, incidentally, autonomy, of course, literally meaning a law unto oneself, which imaged and modelled and prefigured a whole new form of politics, a whole new kind of life in which men and women could live by their own self-determination, by their own freedom, and not be, as it were, slavishly dependent on some external, some heteronymous law. Um, and modernism was a current in this surreally brief history of Western culture that I'm giving you, uh, cutting a few corners here and there, you may have noted, you know, one or two things I've left out, you know. Um, modernism w was a current which happened I mean, in the early 20th century, and which, of course, in its uh, astonishing experimentalism and brilliance and avant-garde inquiry has never been matched since, never been matched since. Long time ago, but it hasn't. But it happened about the same time that culture in general was becoming a full-blown industry. That's to say, when the integration of culture or the arts into the commodity form had reached its peak, more, more or less. The culture industry, you know, film, radio, television, etc., cetera, um, uh, was um, one side of a coin, the other side of which was High modernism, high modernism, among many other things, uh, came to birth as a resistance to what it saw as the pervasive degradation of language and experience under the sovereignty of mass society, so-called. Some, but that wasn't that wasn't the end of the integration of arts into the social order. Some decades later, in our own time. Uh, culture began actively to embrace the process of commodification, uh, became thoroughly and unashamedly and self-flauntingly, as it were, locked into the social order. Um, and since there was now no distance, no daylight, as it were, between it and the society in general, the whole idea, still surviving in high modernism, of the arts as critique really stumbled to a halt. And what I'm talking about there, of course, is so-called post-modernism. And I don't think it's accidental that it's at the same historical moment as post-modernism that the universities uh, do much the same, that's to say, become incorporated increasingly into the ruling order. Uh, you may know that in Britain, for example, the state has now entirely stopped funding the humanities which are uh, almost entirely reliant on students' fees, which means basically on the market. And that's particularly scandalous, I think, in a country uh, which has always rightly rejected the appalling idea that education should be a commodity. Um, and um, uh, I share that uh, view with, um, I'm very proud and pleased to say, with um, one of my rulers, um, Prince Charles, um, who, um, who is not entirely, um, uh, doesn't see entirely eye to eye with me in such in other respects. Um, when some post, uh, some Rhodes scholars from Oxford went to have, or they were allowed an audience with Prince Charles in London. He knew they came from Oxford and they were, some of them were reading English 
and he said, who, who, who teaches you not that dread, dreadful Terry Eagleton, I hope. Uh, of course, what a silly thing to say, because he should have realized that any form of publicity, however negative, you know, from him, would instantly be used by my publishers, you know, and blazoned across the air. <laughs> you know, he could have said far worse things than that, you know, and they would have been in capital letters, you know, marching across the... Anyway, what was I saying? Yes. Um, oh, yes. Uh, th the idea that education is a commodity is, of course, alive and well in the United States. No doubt about that. There are one or two private universities in Britain, but nobody knows where they are. I don't know where to find them out. Um, uh, I spent eight years in Cambridge, uh, and the, um, I never paid a bean for any of it. The state you know, footed the bill for my whole education. There. Admittedly, that was in the period before the Industrial Revolution, um, a long time, you know, when only a tiny elite of people could uh, be treated in that way. But the same, of course, could easily be done today. Most British students believe quite properly that it is the duty of the community to educate their young, not to treat it on the same level as selling an insurance policy. If we in Britain could lay our hands on the untold billions stolen from the people in tax avoidance and evasion by the rich, we'd go a long, long way towards financing free education, as indeed exists in Scotland, interestingly. And if that wasn't enough, we could always take a few banks into public ownership, and then we could rehire their chief executives after a lengthy period of penance, fasting, and self-flagellation. Um, as, you know, cleaners and janitors and that sort of thing. Um, now, this is uh, where I begin to go all metaphysical, so do forgive me for this. So anyway, th there is, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the word autotelism, meaning literally in Greek, um, an end in itself, things that are ends in themselves things which are their own raison d'etre. There's a small class of these things, exceedingly rare objects, uh, which are autotelic, which have their ends in themselves, and the mightiest of these, of this class, is of course God, who is traditionally thought to have his uh, own ground, reason, end, and origin, to have all these things in himself. God is entirely pointless, and that is utterly orthodox theology. God is entirely pointless. He exists for no reason, no end, uh, which is to say that like a joke or like a love lyric, he's his own point. Another of these autotelic things, these very really rare phenomenon, is um, what people call evil, um, which seems mysterious, not because evil doesn't mean very, very wicked, unbelievably wicked. Um, it denotes a certain kind of wickedness, very rare, thank goodness, um, which is the obscenely pleasurable orgy of destruction for its own sake. You might argue, you might argue, it's controversial, that the Holocaust was an example of that because it's very hard, if you think about it, to say why you had to kill six million Jews. You didn't, if you want to make a bogeyman of Jews, you don't, or anybody, you don't have to kill six million of them. You might have to do that to purify the race, but why do you want to do that? And so on. Um, there is incidentally a remarkably cheap and attractive uh, book on this topic called On Evil, written by um, myself. <laughs> Theologically speaking, in orthodox mainstream Christian theology, uh, to say that God created the world uh, isn't at all a statement about how the universe got started. It's nothing to do with that. First year theology student ought to know that. Yeah? It's not some kind of pseudo-science. Um, as you know, old-fashioned 19th century rationalists like Richard Dawkins tend to think. I, um, I like annoying Richard Dawkins by... Um, Every time I mention his name uh, in a public lecture, I, um, first of all, I pretend to forget what his name is and get it wrong. And secondly, I say, you know, the man whose uh, 
The only thing I know about him is that his wife used to act in Doctor Who. <laughs> Which is true, actually. She did. She did. Anyway, from Doctor Who back to theology, the greatest of all theologians, well, maybe, I don't know, Augustine, Paul, but Thomas Aquinas, Aquinas thought it was perfectly conceivable that the world had no beginning, as indeed did his great mentor Aristotle. Um, he actually did think it had a beginning, but he thought it was perfectly reasonable to, to believe that it didn't. The doctrine of creation has nothing to do with the Big Bang or with cosmic soup or all of that properly atheistic stuff. Science is properly atheistic. Yeah? Um, it has to do, among other things, with the idea, uh, the fact that the world, being God's, shares in his own autotelic nature. To say the world belongs to, is dependent on God, is to say that it is independent, paradoxically. It is an end in itself, not slavishly dependent on its creator, but sharing in the freedom and self-dependency and self-determination of its creator. Um, and nowhere is that more obvious than in the case of men and women, in the case of human beings. Um, atheist and believer are entirely at one in their belief that the world isn't for anything at all. It exists like a work of art, purely for its own self-delight, uh, and therefore resembles a work of art rather more than it does a piece of industrial manufacture. The doctrine of creation is meant to be a refutation of instrumentalist rationality, yeah? rationality that dominates late capitalist societies. There's absolutely no need for the cosmos at all. The doctrine of creation is an answer to the question, to the, I suppose, the most fundamental question one can raise, namely, why is there something rather than nothing? The doctrine of creation is an answer to that, and its answer is no reason at all. It's purely contingent that there's anything whatsoever, as indeed many modernism many modernists appreciate the fact that there, that there is no being which is not purely gratuitous and contingent. There's no need for the cosmos at all, and there's certainly no need for Tom Cruise and Justin Bieber. I refer to those people just to show you that I'm not just a stuffy intellectual, you know, but I'm actually a real human being. You know, I, in fact, um, Please don't let this go beyond these four walls. Uh, any journalists here? Uh, I know there's one journalist here. Um, don't publish this, but I, um, I once slept in Madonna's bed. <laughs> she wasn't there herself, I'm afraid, but uh, can't have everything. Um, uh, so the doctrine of creation is something about the way in which human beings are at their finest when they are most pointless. Um, not all fine human activities, of course, are pointless. Feeding the hungry is not pointless. But generally speaking, it's about the fact that um, the most uh, interesting and valuable and precious things exist, to, to, to use a technical theological term, just for the hell of it. Yes. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Uh, just doing it for the hell of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, or at least, at least, um, as far as human beings go, that's how things should be, according to this view. At the moment, of course, the vast majority of men and women on the planet, uh, like the great majority of those who have ever lived and died, exist for the power and profit of a few. So much so, that um, Arthur Schopenhauer, perhaps who wins the title of the gloomiest philosopher ever to write, so gloomy that he's unwittingly funny, as you know, unrelieved gloom very often is, for some reason I don't understand. Um, uh, Schopenhauer thinks it's absolutely crazy to imagine that all of this, this the wretchedness and suffering and labour, toil of human history has been worth it. He doesn't understand anybody who can't see the fact that it would have been far better if somebody had just called the whole thing off, blown the whistle you know, at some early-ish point 
in the procedure. Um, well, uh, what one might call the politics of creation, creation with a big C, insists that this condition has to be transformed. Um, uh, for the radical romantic heritage, um, you have to create a society in which men and women, as far as feasible, as far as feasible, could realize their powers <coughs> and energies purely for their own sake, um, rather than for the interests of a few. It's this vision that the classical humanities existed to foster, um, and the best-known uh, exponent of this essentially aesthetic way of seeing human beings is, in fact, Karl Marx. Um, it's important to realize, to begin with, Marxism is about leisure, not about labor. Yes? Um, there are only two good reasons to be a Marxist. One is just to annoy people you don't like, you know, when you meet them at parties and so on, you know. And the other is because you don't like to do any work. You know, if you don't like to do any work, then you sign on straight away. Yeah, there's no um, uh, Marx's whole point is that, you know, Marx, of course, is lavish in his praise of capitalism. Lavish. If you read the Communist Manifesto, it's one long hymn of praise to the fabulous material and spiritual goods which that most revolutionary of all modes of production, capitalism, has actually accumulated. Yes, All Marx is doing is saying, well, how come? What are the hidden mechanisms? What are the concealed contradictions whereby this enormous release of human energies and richness results in poverty, wretchedness, inequality, and so on? There must be some fundamental mechanisms which is generating that, and Marx's whole project is to try and put his finger on that. Um, how then could this great accumulation of both material and spiritual wealth, you know, the bourgeoisie that uh, more or less you know, extended democracy, created liberalism, basically created feminism, uh, civil rights and so on, all of which, of course, you know, uh, Marx applauds. Um, how come, uh, how could this enormous accumulation of, of wealth and power be, be used for the common good? Is a question that Marx is raising. Um, and that, for him, means that people must be as far as possible, he's fairly realistic about this, as far as possible released from degrading toil. Um, uh, and you need to reorganize that fabulous wealth in order that this could happen rather than using that technology simply to pump more profit out of people. Um, and if that happened, then as far as Marx is concerned, history would have begun. Because don't forget, that for him, everything that's happened so far is prehistory is just another tedious variation on some cycle of oppression and exploitation. The only way you could break with that is by beginning history itself. And what that would look like, of course, Marx has almost nothing to say, quite properly, because, uh, first of all, the um, traditional Jews were forbidden to make images of utopia. Uh, you can't make images, th the reason why you can't make graven images of God, of course, for, for Judaism, is because the only image of God is us, the only image of God is human beings, yes? But you can't make images of the future either, because that's to try to, as it were, predetermine uh, what can't be predetermined. Um, Marx is a prophet, if you like, he's a secular Jewish prophet, not in the commonly mistaken meaning of the word prophet, which is somebody who sees the future, the Hebrew prophets don't actually have much to say about the future. Um, what they, he, they're not clairvoyants. You know. um, what they have to say is that um, uh, unless we change our ways and seek for justice, then there ain't going to be a future. Or if there is, then it's going to be pretty unpleasant. That's what the prophets exist for. Um, 
very um, close to Marx's view of leisure as being central to humanity, um, what he continually, almost in a mantra, calls the, uh, the free expression of human powers and capacities. That has to be, um, the, the way that differs from liberalism, which of course also believes in the free uh, realization of individuals, is it has for Marx, uh, and indeed for Hegel, it has to be reciprocal. In other words, you have, to you, uh, you have to find some way in which the free, well, as he says in the Communist Manifesto, the free development of each would be the condition of the free development of all. Yes, that's to say a, mute, a reciprocity of self-development so that the development of one person would, be, uh, would find its conditions of possibility in and through the development of others. When you look at that interpersonally, one person finding his or her self-realization in and through the self-realization of somebody else, we call that love. Yes? Marx is really about what that, what, well, the concept of political love. What would that look like at the level of a whole society? You know, how would you do that? Um, love, of course, in its authentic meaning, I, I don't mean you know, the, the debased, erotic and romantic um, notions of love that we have at the moment in a society veritably obsessed by sexuality. I mean the traditional good old New Testament idea of love as caritas or agape, which of course is utterly impersonal, has nothing to do with cosy feelings or warm glows whatsoever. It doesn't matter wh whether you know the person whose place you take in the queue for the gas chamber, you just take their place. You might feel utter repugnance for them. It doesn't matter at all. Love in the authentic Judaic uh, heritage is utterly and ruthlessly impersonal. You are c uh, and that's why the paradigm of love in the New Testament, so-called, bit of an anti-Semitic term perhaps, is the love of strangers and enemies, not of friends. Anybody can love a friend. That's not what it's about. Anyway, I'm just wandering into another lecture there, so I will try desperately and cunningly to scramble back to this one with an apparently seamless continuity between the two. Uh, we go? Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, actually, very close to Marx's idea of self-realization and leisure and so on is, um, of all people, Oscar Wilde, my, uh, my fellow countryman, um, uh, for whom, uh, who in his wonderful pamphlet or leaflet or essay, The Soul of Man Under Socialism, exactly talks about the need to automate labor in order to release people into whatever kind of freedom or self-expression they want and whose ideal, one imagines, is just, you know, that in the ideal society we, we would just lie around the place all day in various interesting postures of jouissance, uh, sipping absinthe, um, wearing loose crimson garments and reading Homer to each other. <laughs> and that would just be uh, the working day. You know, I won't begin to <laughs> describe the... Uh, uh, Yes, um, um, and it's no accident that Wilde, of course, was a socialist, was an Irish Republican socialist, as well as an aesthete. His aestheticism is very close to his socialism. Uh, um, and when Marx himself comes to consider a model of production, he turns not to coal mines or cotton mills, he turns to the work of art. He turns to the work of art, because that, he sees, is a self-delighting communication of energy uh, uh, in itself. And so that for this lineage, there's no need to justify the arts or the humanities. Um, and the problem or the question that arises perhaps is that this might seem, as with Wilde, too patrician, too privileged a view, yes? Um, isn't it a bit like hoisting those Madeira bottles up from the pantry? Well, think again of Wilde, who was the perfect English gentleman in the way that only one who was not English can be, you know, plus anglais que les anglais, you know, 
Eliot, many others, uh, Conrad. Um, but Wilde, who in his typically perverse way, uh, th the perverse view of a colonialist, uh, oh sorry, of, of, of a colonial, the um, perversity that seems almost ingrained in small societies, Ireland, Britain's oldest colony, still part of it a colony today, um, in which your whole effort is put into upending and inverting and mocking the received wisdom of the metropolis. That's why Wilde is such a, a wit. It's very closely connected to the fact that it com he comes from a colonial society like Sam Beckett. Um, uh, the, the leisure of the aristocrat can be can prefigure, in a way, uh, a future in which the great majority of men and women would also be free of toil. He would have been appalled, I think, by the American Puritan habit of rising at the crack of dawn and going to bed at 9.30, you know, which uh, many Americans do. Uh, he would understand that uh, any truly civilized society seeks seeks to stay in bed as long as possible in the morning and stay out of it as long as possible in the evening. However, if the humanities are in trouble, it isn't only because of the philistinism of our redneck rulers and managers, because there are certain seismic upheavals within the humanities themselves, which perhaps can best be summarized by saying that in late modernity, the humanities, or if you like, culture, maybe better here, better term, um, have actually shifted over from being part of the solution to being part of the problem. I think that is a sort of paradigm shift that underlies much of what's been going on. They thus have a remote uh, relation to uh, the German satirist Karl Krauss's view of psychoanalysis, which he said was the uh, part of the problem to which it's a solution. I mean by that this, that in 19th century Europe, the humanities could be seen as a kind of spiritual answer to various forms of social and political conflict and upheaval. They stood for what it meant to be essentially human, um, at a level which was thought to undercut our relatively superficial differences, a kind of common ground on which one could meet purely as human. And if the arts were important, it was among other reasons because that's a rather abstract idea which has to be brought home to lived experience. And the work of art concretizes this consensus, gives it tangible body, um, invests this abstraction with a kind of sensuous existence. The, the arts are among other things a kind of portable very conveniently portable version, at least books are, of the values by which people lived. You know, if you want your colonial subject to know what it means to be civilized, you don't give them long, boring lectures, you hand them a volume of Shakespeare. Yes, the portability of the arts is politically very convenient. However, a and in many ways, this tradition of liberal humanism, which so many leftists have scorned, it was a magnificent tradition, full of gener generous, good-natured belief in, the co in common humanity. Um, the problem was it seemed to be able to achieve or, uh, yes, identify that common humanity only by suspending or ignoring human differences. And it was these differences, of course, that gradually came to the fore as the 20th century wore on. The single most supremely successful revolutionary movement of the modern age has not been socialism or feminism or anarchism, but of course revolutionary nationalism. Revolutionary nationalism which in the middle years of the last century transformed the face of the earth, detached one colonial clientist society after another from the arrogance of imperial power an enormously ambitious and to some degree successful, to some degree successful project. Um, and for revolutionary nationalism, um, uh, culture 
far from being a solution to political struggle, is actually um, the very language in which it's articulated. That's what I mean by culture shifting over from being a solution to being part of the problem. Culture in its broad anthropological sense, you know, culture as kinship, identity, tradition, language, heritage, community, and so on, uh, was now the very medium in which political struggles were being waged. And the same was to be true of the various forms of identity politics which followed on the heels of the revolutionary nationalist movements. Culture itself, in other words, was now a, a, a terrain of contention, which was hardly the case for you know, Diderot or Schiller or Matthew Arnold or the early Thomas Mann and so on. Uh, indeed, from the, from the standpoint of this more traditional liberal humanist notion of culture, um, the very phrase cultural politics is yet another um, oxymoron or self-contradictory phrase like, you know, Texan haute cuisine um, or, you know, mor Mormon intellectual. Yes, I <laughs> hope there are none here. Um, why? Because on this view, culture actually constituted itself by disowning what it saw as the degraded domain of the political. Um, now, however, in an extraordinary transformation, which is still with us in our own time, um, culture could be summarily identified or defined as what people are prepared to die for. Culture is, in its broad sense, is what people are prepared to die for or kill for. Nobody has ever been prepared to die for Balzac or Bellius, you know, except maybe a few seriously weird people, you know, hiding out in caves somewhere, too ashamed to come out and confront the rest of us, you know. Um, but certainly, certainly, lots and lots of people are prepared to die for culture in its everyday sense. Um, uh, that's, and that, that whole development spelt the demise of a certain version of the humanities, a traditional liberal version of the humanities, which certainly can't be replaced by a mere fetishism of difference, by a mere nominalism, as it were. Um, perhaps um, one might see the idea of common humanity as something which is not given but is a project still to be constructed. Yes, um, perhaps one should re re respond to the phrase common humanity uh, rather as Mahatma Gandhi responded when he, asked what he, was, what he th was asked what he thought of British civilization and replied that he thought it would be a very good idea. Yes, yeah. something still to be achieved, not something as it were given to you. Um, and to do that, I think, would mean a new sort of humanism, which I've sometimes called um, tragic humanism, uh, because the humanism that we have is too hubristic and self-admiring. Uh, it would mean, for example, accepting that to be human is, in the first place, to be an animal, yes, and to be uh, quite apart from fashionable Postmodernists talk about cultural uh, construction and other forms of the ideology of culturalism. That what we are is, you know, um, lumps of natural matter. It may not sound very sexy, you know, and maybe some of us are more lumpy than others, you know. But what human beings are are lumps of natural matter, and anything, anything that we can get up to which is more sexy and glamorous than that has to be based upon that, not based upon a denial of our finitude, which is the ruling ideology of the most powerful nation in the world. America is in the grip and has always been, because of its peculiar history, its pioneer history, of a, a pathological belief and utterly blasphemous and hubristic belief in the infinitude, potential infinitude of humanity. Nowhere else than in the United States does one hear again and again the ludicrous 
proposition that I can be anything I want if I try. What, a banana, perhaps? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Utterly, utterly ludicrous. And, yeah, and uh, the, uh, the Orange Lord, as, as some of us call Donald Trump, the Orange Lord just absolutely epitomizes that lethal, lethal belief in the boundlessness of humanity. Wh when the ancient Greeks heard that kind of talk, they trembled and looked at the skies, waiting for, you know, <laughs> comeuppance. Um, so it means in the first place, accepting uh, our animality, and that, for me to go back for a moment to uh, Thomas, well, first of all, uh, the philosopher Alexander Kuzhev once said that man is a fatal disease of the animal. Man is a disease of the animal. Man is an animal which is lacking, and that, we, that lack we call desire. Yes? Not appetite or impulse um, or instinct, but that peculiarly human achievement and tragedy, uh, which is both the making and the ruin of us, which we call desire. A different psychoanalysis is morality is the science of human happiness, Morality is about what would it take to be happy? What would it involve for us to be happy? Psychoanalysis is the science of human unhappiness, of the way that a certain kind of unhappiness or lack constitutes us to our very roots, all right? Um, but anyway, um, I don't know how I got onto that. Uh, um, but oh yes, man is a fatal disease of the animal. And, uh, and Thomas Aquinas, again, to go back to him, Aquinas uh, believes that uh, human rationality is essentially an animal rationality. That's to say, we think as we do, roughly because of the kinds of bodies we have. We think, for example, discursively, I mean in time, you know, unfolding. And that, for Aquinas, is because of the kinds of creatures we are. An angel, for Aquinas, would not think in anything like the same way, if it thought at all, because of the kind of body it has, or doesn't have, perhaps, you know, who knows. Um, uh, for, for Aquinas, our animality goes all the way down. It's not as though, you know, we're animals with something called a soul attached to it. A soul is simply a way, of a language in which to describe what is unique about certain kinds of animals who are communicative, productive, reciprocal, relational, and so on. Um, if a lion could speak, Wittgenstein famously remarks, we would not be able to understand what he said. Why not? Could we not just um, get a translator in, you know, wear earphones, somebody fluent in Lyonese or, you know? No, not for Wittgenstein. Why not? Because, I don't know whether this is right or not, but because he thinks that a lion's whole material bodily existence is so different from ours that we wouldn't be able to communicate. Uh, its practical material form of life is different from us. And for Wittgenstein, our language is interwoven with that practical life through and through. Um, it's true that Aquinas would have believed in the disembodied soul of Michael Jackson, if he'd known about him, um, but he would not have believed that it was Michael Jackson. He would most certainly not have believed that the disembodied soul of Michael Jackson was Michael Jackson, because for Aquinas, quite rightly, identity is corporeal to its roots. Christianity is about the risen body, not about some detached kind of soul. Um, humanity, on this view, is that curious creature which has established itself on the basis of a distance from and denial or disavowal of its own animality. And the humanities have sometimes reflected this kind of spiritual supremacism. For Christian theology, by, by contrast, history turns on the animality of God, otherwise known as Jesus. The other, I'll, sorry to be going on so long, I'll just finish here. The other um, great defect with um, this traditional version of humanism is not only this kind of hubris, this refusal of human frailty and finitude, but um, 
it's, th it's not sufficiently tragic. It might seem strange to say that something isn't sufficiently tragic, as though tragi tragedy were a value, yes. But in a way it is, you see. I mean, we, will, we wouldn't, tragedy always involves value. Most of us wouldn't call tragic the destruction of a flea. Some people might, but most of us wouldn't. Why not? Because we don't rate fleas that highly. Yes, I'm, I'm sure they're fine creatures in their own way, very good little fellows. You know, I don't wish to be, you know, um, uh, excessively patronizing to fleas, you know, but their life does look a little boring from the outside, you know, and not quite of the status of Antigone, you know, or, uh, yeah. anyway. Um, uh, and this, uh, a tragic humanism, this one which, unlike the United States, unlike that compulsively sort of affirmative, you know, uh, to be negative in the States is a kind of thought crime. You know, you have to be positive, you know, in a square-jawed kind of way. Uh, a society which tends to sweep loss and death and failure and sickness under the carpet uh, fails to recognize that the human is possible only on the basis of the inhuman. Only through a solidarity with failure, uh, with the disfigured humanity, as the ancient Greeks knew, as Sophocles knew, only on that basis is any authentic humanity possible. And the great poet, I think, of that condition in our age is Samuel Beckett, product of, a, of an island known for its wretched and tragic history. For Christianity, the key signifier of human history is the tortured body of a suspected political criminal. The Romans reserved crucifixion almost entirely for political criminals, for political rebels. Either Jesus was one or they, it was convenient for them to pretend that he was. Um, who spoke out for justice, whose mission seemed to have collapsed disastrously around his ears, and who was done to death by the state for his pains. Incidentally, um, the New Testament presents the, the Roman state in the form of Pontius Pilate, you know, governor of Judea, who he presents as a sort of vacillating, inquiring, rather confused sort of, you know, guardian reading liberal, you know. Um, uh, we know quite a lot about Pilate, actually. He was a complete bastard. He was an absolute tyrant. He crucified at the drop of a hat. You know, he would have crucified his own grandmother. If it was, it was an absolute tyrant. Pilate was finally dis dismissed from the Roman service for dishonorable conduct. You had to be pretty dishonorable to be dismissed by the Romans. You know, you know. Um, so the message of the Christian gospel, or this this nice comforting pie in the sky. You know, uh, if you don't love, you're dead, and if you do they'll kill you. Yeah. There's your pie in the sky for you. Only by staring the gorgon's head of the real in the eyes without being turned to stone is there any hope of resurrection. That's a kind of tragic humanism. Only if this frightful tra trauma is acknowledged as the last word might it just cease to be. Otherwise you buy your affirmation on the cheap. I mean if Jesus had thought to himself you know, ah, well, only six hours hanging up here, then three days in the tomb, then off to heaven. Oh, yeah, sounds right, you know. I'll sign on for that, yes. Then according to Christian doctrine, he would never have been raised from the dead. You have to live your death to the end. You have to appropriate your death, as Heidegger might say, um, uh, to go all the way through that radical self-dispossession if you are to emerge somewhere on the other side with no guarantees. Um, uh, which is to say that Calvary is a genuinely tragic action. Well, you might say it didn't end badly as far as uh, the gospel writers were concerned, but then tragedy doesn't always end badly. One of the first and greatest tragedies we have, the Oresteia, doesn't end badly. Um, Tragedy just means that you have to be hauled through hell if you're to achieve any degree of redemption, and you may not. Yeah. If you die with the ace of salvation up your sleeve, then that's just, that won't work. As Marx comments, only by um, 
a loss of humanity, can there be a renewal of it? Such is the crookedness of humanity <coughs> that only by virtue of breaking can human powers be remade. And that itself is, is in a way tragic. Would that it would not the case. Would that we could achieve the kind of justice and so on, friendship that we want, without that breaking. But the power of human malevolence, what I suppose traditionally is called original sin, is such that only by a breaking and remaking is that possible. As uh, Yeats says, uh, um, nothing can be sold or whole that has not been rent. R-E-N-T, torn. Um, this is an insight which Marxism, Christianity and psychoanalysis all in their very different ways share, I think, as against a certain ruling conventional liberal wisdom for which this is really much too bleak and extremist and uncongenial. Um, uh, and the humanities have, reject have reflected that rejection of this vision um, you know, they haven't exactly rushed to acknowledge uh, in the way that, say, Walter Benjamin does, that the um, obscene underside of human value, as Nietzsche certainly does, has been violence, misery and exploitation. Uh, what blood and suffering lie at the root of all great things, Nietzsche says. And he doesn't mean that they're, not, they're therefore not great, but it's that dialectical vision which one has to foster. For Marx, human history, modern history, has been one enthralling tale of emancipation from the confines of the ancien regimes, you know, an unleashing of human energies and one long nightmare. And those two things are the recto and verso of the same sheet of paper. For every cathedral, a pit of bones. For every great Victorian poet, the maid servants who heated his bathwater. A humanities that would confront that unpalatable truth and try to reconstitute itself in the light of it, well, that now, I think, really would be fighting, worth fighting for. Thank you very much. Yeah.